Hello everyone, welcome to my tutorial series on reforming the pagan faiths of Crusader Kings 2. With the upcoming Holy Fury DLC, playing as a pagan will be more flavorful than ever before. We are getting new societies, new events, and the thing I am most excited about, brand new reformation mechanics. In order to help prepare you for the challenges of reforming the old ways and standing up to the power of the Crescent Moon and the Cross, this series will focus on various ways to bolster your chances of successfully leading your religion through reformation and bringing the pagan world into the forefront. Before we get into it, I will be playing without the Jade Dragon DLC activated, as it is a relatively new DLC, and I want this video to be applicable to as many people as possible. However, if you do have this DLC activated, then the additional Casus Belli will serve you well. Without further ado, let's begin with my personal favorite faith and culture in the game, the Norse. The first thing we need to look at is which start date to choose. In this tutorial, we will be choosing the 769 start date, as I believe this to be the easiest start date to begin in as a Germanic pagan. In 769, the situation for pagans is fairly strong, with a bastion of Germanic paganism still strong in the Kingdom of Saxony, who is the last bastion of Germanic paganism still strong against the Christian Catholic menace to their immediate south. In the north, the fractured tribes of Norsemen bicker and fight with each other, awaiting the rise of a strong king to unite them against the Christians to their south and the Suomesco pagans to their east. Next, we get to choose which character to start as. The Germanic pagan who is in the strongest position to expand and reform the faith, in my opinion, is King Sigurd Ring of Sweden, or Svizjad. He is an independent Duke-tier Norse Germanic pagan whose capital sits right on top of one of the holy sites of his faith, as we can see upland right here. With the other two holy sites, Namendal, right here in the north, and Shaland here in Denmark, nestled almost immediately bordering his kingdom, with lots of Suomesco pagans immediately to his east. This is going to be important for later. We'll get to that in a little bit. But for now, let's go ahead and begin playing as King Sigurd Ring. When you're setting up the rules for the game, there are a couple things that I like to do. Um, some of them seem a little bit gamey, and they make it a lot easier to reform the faith. Some of them are just, you know, fun and up to your personal preference. Only true CK2 players actually play in Iron Man mode, and so if you are a true CK2 player, you will be playing in Iron Man mode, and there is no such thing as save scumming. I like to play with secret religion, religious cults off because I personally don't like the mechanics all that much. Um, it seems a little weird that you can be running a Christian realm over in France and suddenly you have a secret Buddhist revolt begin. Um, it's a little odd. Devil Worshippers I put off because that is way too gamey. Um, Shattered Retreat I like to turn off because I like the original CK2 style of combat. Um, defensive packs make absolutely no sense for this time era. Um, Defensive packs are basically the same thing as coalitions in uh, Europa Universalis, for those of you who play that. However, I just think it is pretty dull. Um, the only other thing that you could try to do in order to increase your chances of reforming the faith is to turn the Charlemagne story events off. Um, what this is going to do is this is going to prevent Charlemagne from having an immediate Casus Belli to claim all of Saxony and potentially rip one of the holy sites away from the Germanic faith. And so, for the sake of this tutorial, since I want to start you guys off a little bit easier, I'm going to play with Charlemagne's story events off. Plus, I love to see his realm completely implode into a million bajillion gavelkind messes, so I am going to leave it off. Without further ado, let us start. New Ways for the Old Gods Alright, so now that we're in the game, the first thing we're going to want to do is observe our surroundings to see what exactly we're dealing with. As we can see here, we as Sigurd Ring are currently in control of three demenses. Um, we've got a good roll on skilled tactician for military benefits so that we're going to be able to steamroll everyone around us. Uh, for your focus, if you have the Way of Life DLC, I like to go ahead and choose War, um, not Hunting, which is a little bit different than what I think most people will do. And the reason I like to choose that is simply because there is a lot of flavor events with the War Focus that gives you a lot of honor. And honor, as you all know, allows you as a tribal pagan to raise a huge army of men. 500 prestige gives you an army. That's really, really, really powerful. And considering that some of the events can give you 200 prestige sometimes at a time, it's really handy. Another really, really important thing to know about playing as a pagan is that you should always, in my opinion, have the become king of X country picked as your ambition. 
What this does is it gives you an unlimited number of uses of the subjugate other pagan cast a spelly in your kingdom. So, uh, if we take a look at the Dejer Kingdom of Sweden right here, which is where we are currently located, we'll see that all of this land here is considered part of the Kingdom of Sweden. That means that we can declare the subjugate Casus Belli against every single one of these little derps in this area and force them to become part of our realm. And I'm going to demonstrate that here. Kingdom of Sweden activated. And now I will be able to declare war on every single one of these guys. Now, typically, when you're playing as a pagan, you get one use of that Casus Belli. You can subjugate one pagan per lifetime of your ruler. So, as Sigurd Ring, I could declare subjugation Casus Belli once outside of the Kingdom of Sweden. But, now that I have that ambition activated, I can declare that war against any of these guys I want. So, I can effectively form the Kingdom of Sweden very, very rapidly. Now, a great thing to know about that subjugate Cassus Belli is that if this country right here, Shayland, happens to declare war, a subjugate war, and win against any of these guys here who are in the Kingdom of Sweden, that gives me a Cassus Belli against him to declare that exact same war. So, theoretically, if this guy right here, Harald Wartooth, were to subjugate either of these guys in the Kingdom of Sweden, I would be able to subjugate him and thereby gain control of the entirety of Denmark as well. All of this land, all of here, making Holy Site number two in my direct control. Not only would that give me the ability to have two Holy Sites and pretty much double the size of my realm, but it would also allow me to form the Kingdom of Sweden. One of the most important things that to know about playing as the Norse here is that these guys are all waiting for a strong leader in order to rise up. The way the game mechanic works is that when you are of the same faith and the same culture, if you are two, um, how you want to say, tiers, so count, duke, king, emperor, above the individual you're looking at, you can offer vassalization and they will almost always accept it. So as of right now, if I take a look at this guy right here, and I say, offer vassalization, he's not going to want it very much because there's a small difference in our rank. However, if I were to declare myself the king of Sweden, he will absolutely join. What you can do with that is tremendous. If you declare yourself the king of Sweden, you can offer vassalization to every single one of the miners here who have not already formed a duke tier, and immediately make them a part of your realm. It's rapid expansion. That's what puts this start date at a higher tier than the eight, uh, 800 start date, where the Viking Age has already begun, because the majority of these guys are already Duke tiers, and you have to form yourself as a, the Emperor of Scandinavia to get that same effect. We're not going to do that. We're going to shoot right for the Kingdom of Sweden, after subjugating Denmark here, and then immediately vassalizing the entire area here to quickly capture all three holy sites and put us in a direct line of sight towards reforming. So now that the strategy is kind of laid out, let's go ahead and lay the groundwork for doing that. The first thing we're going to want to do is declare subjugation war against all of these guys here. The way that I like to do it is seeing that Sigurd Ring is significantly more powerful than all of these guys. Um, I have in my possession right now 1600 levies. This dude can muster up 350. I can declare multiple wars against these guys to rapidly expand. So here we go. Notice I'm using that same subjugation Cassus Belly, which I should only be able to use once against every single one of these guys. So I'm only going to do it to the bordering ones here. Um, we're going to raise our vassal's troops, not in the same way that you would as a feudal lord. One of the biggest advantages of playing a tribal is that you can directly call your vassals to war. So as you can see there, I just called all of my vassals to war. Vassals being this dude... Uh, that dude, and that dude, they're going to raise all of their men and come and fight me as if they were an ally, which is extremely powerful. I am going to go ahead and fast forward through a lot of the mundane fighting. As you can see, our forces here are significantly stronger than the forces that the uh, miners are able to muster. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just skip through the combat for you guys. But one last thing to note, look how much prestige I have, 32. How much piety I have, 17. One of the advantages of that subjugate Cassus Belly is when you win, you get 100 prestige and 100 piety. The requirements for reforming the faith involve having 750 piety. So, 
by winning a couple of these minor subjugate wars here, 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 and here, you're going to pretty much have enough to reform the faith right then and there, putting you at no stress for generating piety. So I know a lot of people have to take the theological focus in order to generate piety. No need to at all. We're going to have plenty. And obviously the prestige is going to benefit us because as soon as we win five of these wars, we'll be able to click one button and pretty much double the size of our army. So it's pretty great. One thing that I want to note here is it is completely unnecessary to actually kill the armies of the opponents that you're fighting right now. In fact, it's in your benefit not to because these guys are all going to be part of your realm in just a little bit. In order to piece out these guys and make them become part of your realm, all you have to do is quickly attack and siege down their county holdings. So as we see here, I just landed my army in Metal Pad and I told them to assault the walls. You outnumber these guys pretty much 10 to 1 as far as their capitals go because they raise their levies. And if you used to watch the war score down here for the guy I'm fighting, it immediately went to 1%, even though he's got over a thousand men sitting right there. With that, immediate surrender, army's gone. Doesn't even matter. With those wars won, we have just dramatically increased the size of our realm, putting us in a very strong position to be able to form the Kingdom of Sweden proper. The requirements for forming the Kingdom of Sweden involves controlling two duchy titles. That's really easy because we've got the land for it, but it's hard because we don't have the gold for it. Gold is going to be a big problem throughout the course of playing this game. Um, the best way in order to actually get the second duke title is to just simply subjugate one of the pagans down here. And because you're the same tier as this guy. So, I am a duke, this guy is a duke. If I subjugate him, he gets knocked down to a count and I steal his duke title of Ostrogotland. So don't even worry about forming the duchies up here because it's a huge waste of gold. Just continue to subjugate. So I'm getting a little worried here because Mr. Wartooth actually didn't declare a subjugation war against any of the Sweden dukes right here. So we're going to have to get a little bit more inventive on how we're going to secure control of this third holy site. What I'm going to go ahead and do is um, send my chancellor to go fabricate a claim over on the capital itself. That right there is the holy site. And if you didn't know, you can view the holy sites um, of the Germanic faith by clicking on the religions tab. Boom, boom, boom. There's one over here in Saxony, Brunswick. And then there's one controlled by the Christians over in Zealand. We're pretty much going to ignore that one. <laughs> what we can do here is kind of hope that with Denmark declaring war on the miners over here, that he somehow screws up and kills off his army, tempting these guys here to declare a war against him. If either of these guys declare a war against them, then we have automatic access to be able to declare a subjugation war and claim all of Denmark. This might happen in your game, it might not. If it doesn't, like I said, if you have the Jade Dragon, just declare the war in order to conquer the county itself. If you don't, fabricate a claim and you'll be fine. After winning a subjugation war against the Duke of this county right here, I now have the two duckle titles that I need in order to form the Kingdom of Sweden. However, as I stated before, gold is an issue and we are completely out of it. Uh, we need about twice as much as we currently have now in order to get the title. Um, the best way to get this is to attempt to raid the smaller miners outside of this area here. However, you have to be careful of that because all of these counties are really, really poor. And if you spend too long raiding them, then unless you get captives, you're really just going to have a debt uh, a detriment growing on your hand because you're not going to be able to raid fast enough to generate the gold needed to just maintain the troops that are out there. And now that we're just kind of waiting for something interesting to happen, either a claim to get fabricated or for Ostrogotland to declare war against Shaylin or vice versa, I can go ahead and start talking about the little things that you can do to improve the quality of the game that you're playing. One of the things that I neglected to do at the beginning was set up my counselors properly. I like to focus on trained troops in my capital because that's going to be my largest county and it'll give me a really good ability to raise up as much men as possible. Obviously having the highest quality um, counselors as possible is good. Building legend is very very strong because there's a chance that it will spawn a bunch of warriors for you and it gives you one prestige a month which is not that bad. Um, and as far as your seer goes, building zeal will give you that extra little bit of piety to raise you up from the um, small amount that you started with to the amount that you need to actually do the reformation. So that's very important. Last thing I could suggest to do is to go ahead and study technology over in Francia. Um, I like to just plop it, it really doesn't matter, anywhere you want. Um, I know that there's some math and numbers behind where exactly the best place to place it is in accordance to where the technology spread in the world is, but I just don't bother with it. 
we're also not going to want to remain tribal forever, as eventually it's going to have diminishing returns. Uh, the small light troops that we spawn aren't going to be as strong as the feudal heavy troops, and so we're going to want to feudalize. To do that, you need to actually uh, reform your tribal organization up to max, which just involves you clicking buttons every like 10 years um, in order to click the button to be able to form feudalism. Feudalism requires you to have a castle in your capital holding and max tribal organization as well as reformed faith. The first button click here is always free. You can just click it right away. The second one's going to require you to have the uh, backing of your entire council. As of right now, everybody hates me, so it's just not going to happen. So I managed to bite the bullet and go ahead and subjugate the entirety of Dejur Sweden. Um, I didn't want to wait for Shayland to subjugate war on either of these guys. So I went ahead and fought the wars and won. I am 100 piety away from having enough to reform, and I am just about 10 gold away from being able to create the proper title of the Kingdom of Sweden itself. So I'm in a pretty good position now. Now what I want to start doing while I wait for my claim on Denmark to finish, I want to go ahead and start declaring war on the pagans here in the east. The reason I want to start doing that is because my moral authority is still fairly low, and in order to reform the faith, you need 50. I'm at 41 right now. Every county conquest that I declare and win here in the east will increase that moral authority by one, and every temple of theirs that I raid and sack is going to give me an extra one as well. So if I am able to run my army through here, raid the land, temple here, temple here, and you can click around to find any more that there might be, um, you will be able to raise your moral authority up very, very quickly, taking those two temples there, conquering a couple of the provinces, bam, you're at 50 authority. Now you have to be careful about fighting these guys, because they all like to gang up on you as soon as you declare war on them. So if I declare war on this guy, he only has 412 men, but every single one of these guys are going to join in because they're going to defend their true faith. So you've got to be very careful with how you declare these wars. The best way that i found to do it is to declare war on a whole bunch of them at the exact same time, allow them to get all grouped up, and then start marching into your land, and then reroute your army around it, take the county, and because, again, as I showed you before, if you siege down all of their holdings, they will automatically surrender. After finishing these two wars and doing a little bit of light raiding on these provinces here, I have managed to form the Kingdom of Sweden itself. Now, you'll be able to see the true power of playing as a Norse character. And as we can see here, if I attempt to offer vassalization to each one of these guys, they're all going to accept because these guys need a strong king to lead them, and you are going to be their new, not only legal leader, but religious leader as well. Do note that, as you can see with this guy here, I was not able to offer him vassalization. Just because he's at war, allow him to either win or lose that war, and then you'll be able to vassalize. And here's probably the best part about offering vassalization, is here is our holy site right here, number two, willingly just accepted to join our cause. This always feels good every time I do it. We're just rapidly expanding our land. Well, this guy right here doesn't want to join us. Interesting. Well, he'll get what's coming to him eventually. Alright, the event has popped, giving me a claim on the capital of Denmark, so now I will finally be able to declare my war and just in time too, because I have the piety and the moral authority to reform the faith. Just to show you the power of a Norse pagan who has done everything right, look at the amount of vassal levies I'm able to raise to declare war against one guy here. And because I prepared, even though he's got 4,000 men, I can click this button once, and I can click it twice to immediately outnumber him completely two to one and have the entirety of my nation here ready to fight. This 4k stack suddenly isn't so scary. Yeah, nice. Then it was just a simple march to his capital, conquering the holdings, and with that we have conquered the three holy sites we need, we have the piety that we need, we have the moral authority that we need, and that wonderful, wonderful vault that we see there represents our new 
reformation into the Germanic faith. Thank you very much for watching this video, everybody. I hope you all learned something great from it. Let me know if you have any questions down in the comment section below, and I will do my best to answer everyone. Um, this is only the first video in a series that I will be doing on all of the pagan reformations here in Crusader Kings. Um, I don't know which one I'll choose next, so why don't you guys convince me? Let me know which one your uh, pick will be, and I will do my best to get to it. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you next time.